Hello everyone and welcome to this session of our Battery Week. We are pleased to have you here today joining this session. Today we will discuss material handling of battery mass and slurry production and the equipment for the battery market. Uh, so I'm the moderator, Ibrahim Gary, the product sales manager here at Tuna. And today I have the two spokespersons with me, Keith Melton, uh, which is the key account manager for battery and chemical applications at Copier and Catron. And we have Hakan Kariolu, who is the regional sales manager for uh, Scandinavia at Copier and Catron. After the session, if you have any project or more detailed questions, which uh, takes more time, you can always get in touch with me for Sweden and Norway. Uh, for Finland, it's Oli Pekka Tikkinen, and for the Baltic States, it's Andres Putnins. So, Kupier and Ketron is what we're going to discuss today. Equipment for the battery market. We will, next course, again, discuss what the market is. We will discuss, discuss the battery mass and separator of the batteries. We will discuss the equipment as well. So as you see in the diagram, the market is growing and it is predicted to grow even more, much more. So finally, we are changing our behavior in order to give the next generation a future. And uh, the most wonderful part of it from my side at least, is that I'm joining this journey together with Tuna and Copier and Catron. And in this case, when we are discussing the batteries, the batteries is, is an essential, important part of the electric, electrification of ve vehicles. And we have already joined this journey. So here in Europe, the production of batteries are spread all over, the, all over Europe. Uh, so basically it's uh, local production and it is depending on the transportation. So we are trying to have a sustainable life cycle of the whole process. And that includes also the uh, distance. So we, we want to shorten the distance between each uh, side to the customers, so closer to the customers. And from Copier and Catron side, we are involved, as you see in the map, we have several customers already either producing or planning to produce batteries in the future. And uh, we are glad to uh, be involved in this uh, projects and, and supporting the customers. So um, yeah, and, and the reason, this is also the reason why Copier and Catron has created this battery group with among uh, those is Keith and Hakan as both key account manager and specialist. So also very good afternoon from my side. I take over now. Um, this is um, Hakan from um, Copernic Catron in Switzerland. And um, as already mentioned, um, we supply handling systems uh, for bulk materials and liquids. Now we want to show you what we are able to supply for battery applications. That's an overview um, of a battery cell manufacturing process. We, so we can supply material handling systems for slurry pre preparation. And that means we can store the material, we can convey it um, with vacuum air to receivers, and we can feed it into a mixer batch-wise or continuously. Secondly, we also can supply extruders and material handling systems for separator production. But we are not familiar with uh, coating and drying, calendaring, cutting of electrodes um, and electrolyte filling and formation. This is a battery separator process with our twin screw extruder set as K and with our loss in weight feeder, as well as conveying system. Further, we can also supply buyouts for the downstream equipment like film coiler or edge trimming device. At the end of the day, uh, the client can get a turnkey system from us for this process, but many of such lines are installed in Asia. Now we have a flow sheet of a typical material handling system. Uh, this could be, for instance, a slurry preparation. On the left-hand side, uh, we have the big bag stations, and then we convey the materials to the receivers with vacuum sequencing. On the top right, we have a sack tipping stations for the additives with lower throughputs. And then below, we have um, our loss in weight feeders, 
depending on the flowability of the bulk materials, we use agitators or our patented vibrating system, ActiFlow. At the end, uh, we have here almost a fully automated recipe formulation for batch or continuous applications, a mixer for batch, and an extruder for a continuous application. These are our products or single components. On the left side, top is a rotary valve, and then below a so-called glove box. Very important when we have toxic materials to handle. In the mid is the set skate twin screw extruders from Coperion. On the right side, top, the vacuum receiver. And finally, the loss in weight feeder from Coperion Catron. Vacuum sequencing is becoming more and more important to reduce the manufacturing costs. This is our, our vacuum receiver P30 in electro-polished design. Cleaning is very simple. We have almost no moving parts. This receiver is also suitable for OEB, OEL certification, very important. For very sticky materials, we can add some flow weights to the conical bottom part, and we can discharge the material with a butterfly valve, or if necessary, with rotary valves, screw feeders, or gate valves. Now we have here a very nice 3D drawing of a loss in weight feeder. I think this is the most important product for material handling systems. It's no secret that we have a very accurate feeder feeding systems in our product range. But my colleague Keith will show you later some um, very interesting slides what we do differently regarding um, accuracy. Um, this one is suitable for um, sticky materials um, because we have a vertical agitator installed on the lid to avoid breaching problems in the hopper. Additionally, we have a horizontal agitator above the dosing screw. Dosing screw. This agitator is not visible now, but it's in the bowl, in the round bowl, which you can see. And um, at the end, and the client can have um, many different options like seal perching for abrasive materials, ATEX area classification, pneumatic shot of valves on the screw outlet, pressure compensation, um, jet filters. We have the option dust, gas tight. And like, like the receivers, it's also suitable for OEB, OEL certification. Yeah, that's it from my side. Now I, uh, I hand over to my colleague, Keith. Thank you. Uh, my name is Keith Melton. Thank you very much for the other two guys for uh, uh, taking us so far. Um, um, so a bit more detail then about each of the uh, the components of this system and what we've tried to do is split it up into uh, into two bits. And the first bit is then um, about the uh, the feeding component of it. So uh, we like to uh, kind of introduce it with what what's the point in having um, a, a feeder system within your process? Uh, because I guess you know it's it's like well where we have a system and um, how exactly are we going to if you ask it the other way around how exactly are we going to make sure. Um, that the proportion of each of the components um, are going to come into the process uh, accurately, correctly at the right time. And that's exactly why you would need um, a feeding system. Um, multiple ones very often, uh, in fact, most of the processes that I've known uh, bring more than one component together. So it's also critical that those components um, are sequenced and are brought in accurately in relation to each other. And that's the system that you're seeing here. So then uh, I said high accuracy feeding, and I guess that's probably one of the uh, the most famous things about um, Kapir and Catron. That's, that's what we do and that's what we're renowned for. Uh, but we're also asked very, very often is, well, why high accuracy? Um, so what I wanted to try and do again as a bit of an introduction is to show you what high accuracy means. It doesn't just mean that you can have precise the amount of material, though that's what it's all about at the end of it. But what does it mean when you've got poor accuracy? It means you have too much going into your process or too little. And what does that mean? Normally it means wastage. Normally it means scrap. It means downtime and you know, general lack of control or efficiency within a system. So you don't know how much material's in, you don't know what your costs are, and you don't know what the quality of your end product is. So if you have a system that's then delivering very, very accurately, of course you have complete control 
over what's going in and therefore also what's coming out. And it's not just a case of doing that in terms of the, uh, the, the process, uh, let's say the, the amount of a certain material that's going in, it's also that then represents the, uh, the costs of that. Um, we also try and show that a little bit here graphically, so you can see that this is what would actually happen on the uh, the output of a of a loss in weight feeder. And these numbers are actually taken from one of our um, one of our tests. And then, so we we want um, a high accuracy system. How exactly uh, do we start that process? Well, the the first thing that we have to look for um, is the material itself. And when we're designing feeders we have first to look at the kind of material um, that we need to handle. And you can look, uh, I don't guess we have to read through all of these uh, parameters. Those are critical parameters, of course, but you can see that very, very graphically down the, um, down the right-hand side. Obviously, if you're handling something like um, a corn flake or a flake material, it's very different to if you're handling, handling something like a battery mass material. So that those are the, the, the basics of it. So if we then apply it to um, some of the, the, the more exotic materials that we come into contact with uh, within the battery industry, it then goes on a level. So we know that most of these materials, uh, they're not very easy to handle. They're particularly bad flowing. Uh, they're cohesive. Um, uh, they have very high... Um, angles of repose. And the other big thing is a lot of them or the active parts of them are toxic. So they're harmful to material. I guess also you could say to that, that these materials are also um, sensitive to environments. So you need to keep the operator safe from the material and you need to keep the material safe from the environment. So there's a couple of aspects there also that we need to worry about. So how do we go about um, with feeder selection. And on the next slide, we should try and show very graphically, look, um, with certain materials, if you try and just move it around a little bit, it doesn't necessarily want to move as easily um, as you want it to. Um, so in these cases uh, where material tends to bridge as this one did, when the tube was held completely inverted, the material didn't drop down. So how exactly are you going to handle material like that? If it doesn't flow well, um, we would very often take, uh, though not universally, we would very often take something like the twin screw feeder, which is the one then you can see the two screws, the twin screw in the middle. If we then have a material which has um, a granular nature, or if it's very free flowing, then we could take something like the, uh, the single screw. So depending on the nature of the product is the selection then for um, the mechanical component of the feeder. And we're showing here just screw feeders, but of course the same process applies to the belt feeders or BSP feeders. Um, or also like in the next example, which is then with um, liquid systems. So a major property for um, a liquid, of course, the, um, the viscosity of it. So if we then try to move some of the materials around, you can see on the left-hand side, this is a very um, a low viscosity um, oil. In the middle, we have an oil with a higher viscosity, and on the end, we have a silicon material. So how would you approach um, handling each of those different materials? And those are the kind of questions that, we'd, uh, that we would have to ask ourselves. As I said before, so depending on the kind of material, uh, we would then have a different selection of screw and not to go through completely what we have, but you can see up this end, we've got a twin screw um, with a concave profile um, to the screw. And then at this end with the granulate material, we then have something like these, uh, what we call spiral screws. So I open flighted screws. So really material properties will then determine um, the mechanical handling system for the material. So the next component that we come to um, is then measuring. Um, so what do we do in terms of measuring? So again, I'm, I'm going to the loss in weight screw feeder as the example, uh, but this applies exactly to the other ways of um, handling materials in feeding. So 
we're talking specifically about the load cell system. And this is weighing, this is data from the machine to see exactly what's going on with the feeding. So what do we do? Um, and in basic or in um, general terms, you have to have a load cell system within there. Um, within Capir and Catron terms, we use something which is called the, the SFT, which is Smart Force Transducer. Uh, which is 100% digital technology. So in the, the center of one of these, there's a vibrating wire um, and using vibrating wire technology, um, which I could go on for a long time, but uh, I don't have time to do it here, unfortunately, uh, which is incidentally, if anybody does want to know more about anything um, which we say here, then you should please either ask a question um, or come back to Ibrahim and we'd be very, very happy to elaborate on these subjects. Um, but the, the kind of the highlight or the, at the end of it, the resolution of one of these vibrating wire units is now at one part to eight million parts. So it's incredibly high. Uh, but the other feature of it is the very rapid sampling time. So we have a connection up to the, um, the controller at 20 milliseconds. Um, but actually inside one of these things, we're sampling 450 times per second. And without kind of going through too much what you can do with that, I have an example. So I have a video which then shows what's going on with it. So here we have a setup with two materials, uh, with two liquids, in fact. Uh, the red liquid is using a standard load cell. The business card weighs around about one gram and then you see on the red line we then jump up and you can see look aha there you go it's one gram and we're in a static system at the moment so we should be able to do the same thing with our um, fast so this is the one with the um, the filtering in 450 millisecond sampling i beg your pardon 450 times a second sampling so we can also then simulate a loss in weight system. Um, so at the base of the, the liquids, uh, I beg your pardon, of the tanks, we then have a small tap. So we open the tap very slightly. So we're not talking about one grams now, gram now, we're talking about parts of a, and you can see on the screen then what's happening from both of them. Again, this is a static system. Um, so we're not really trying to challenge these two yet. Uh, but what we do now, which we don't recommend you do in your process, but what we do now is we're shaking the whole table. And if you look at the uh, the liquids, how they're bouncing around, you get a really good visual effect of to, well, what's happening with those um, two weighing systems. And they're being shaken around a lot. And what you can see when we get back to the trace, so you see very clearly that the liquid is being moved around. Um, you can see very clearly the red is now no longer able to see what's going on with it exactly because the weight on the load cell is jumping up and down. So if we introduce this one gram weight, it's very hard to see where that's been introduced. So then if we introduce the one gram weight to the fast sampling, you can then see pretty clearly, and we'll see a blow up of that shortly. So you can see now exactly where and look, I'd also say this isn't absolutely perfect, right? You can see that there are no straight lines, um, but in fact, this is the reality of the situation. This is pretty good sampling. This is, sorry, this is pretty good filtration technology, but there's no way it's going to be able to sample it, um, sorry, filter it absolutely so that you end up with a straight line, but that's a little bit the reality of the situation. Um, so the next element is then the, the control part to it. So we've talked about the, the hardware. So the bit that's doing the handling, we've talked about the measuring, and we need to then bind all of that together with a control system. Um, so this is what we call a, a KCM. Um, it's actually, this is taken from a what's new about it. So uh, this is a bit the, uh, the features from... Um, um, or a comparison with the older system, but it, it's, a, it's a text graphic interface. 
Um, we can actually handle lots of different languages with it, so also graphic-based languages. Uh, but for me, the, uh, the the newest thing or the, uh, the the most impressive thing about the uh, the latest technology is this uh, back to the 20 millisecond sampling time. And what that means in terms of control is now um, you're looking at what's happening with your um, with your load cells that much quicker. Um, that you're able to control the process at a much much higher rate, which means at the end of it you're able to um, you're able to control your feeder um, a step more accurately than was previously possible um, with um, with older controllers and indeed most of the controllers that are available on the market. The other thing, of course, is the expanded connectivity. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing today that all factories need to be connected together. We need to get the information from the process and get it into the central um, control systems or the central management system so you can see exactly what's going on. Um, what's also, and you know, I kind of see when I see things like this, we, we have a Wi-Fi um, connection. Um, this is not so that uh, the factory can surf the internet, but it is so that you can get the... Um, the data specifically from uh, the KCM onto a mobile device, um, whether it's a phone, whether it's an iPad, or whether it's a laptop computer, doesn't matter. Um, so to try and put that all together, um, what we try and show, uh, particularly with the uh, the vibrating table, is that the the reality of feeding isn't about dealing with straight lines. It's being actually having the technology that's able to interpret the signals that's coming back from um, a real factory situation, and then being able to control accurately based on it. So when these um, anomalies or when the vibrations being introduced, we can actually understand what's going on um, because we have the high speed load cell technology and we're also sampling very, very quickly and also a, a great deal of experience within the, uh, the software that we have. Um, and that allows us to be able to produce still very, very accurate results, even with sometimes some quite poor um, data coming from the process. Um, then really, a, it's only a quick introduction to pneumatic conveying um, so that we can see uh, a little bit of an introduction. And when I say pneumatic conveying, of course, I'm showing here, this is a, um, it's a vacuum sequencing system, we call it. But of course, Coperion are very famous for doing um, pneumatic conveying systems under lean phase pressure, dense phase pressure. And indeed, we have some, um, some fluid transfer systems as well. So this is only really as a little bit of a, an introduction. And what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to move uh, from one point. So from a point A, from a pickup device across to um, a receiving point. So um, across to this uh, receiver. And how will we do that? Well, we're doing it by moving air through the system. And in moving the air, we're actually carrying the material with it. Um, and what that actually means, what I try and do, um, I'll just show you an example. This is what happens, and you can try this at home. So introduce air into the sugar, and you can see that the sugar, it's not so easy to blow around. But then if you introduce talc into the, uh, sorry, you introduce air into the talc, you can see that's very, very easy to move around. And in fact, it's got a lot to do with the, uh, the material properties that we looked at previously. Um, so really what we try to do when we're looking at these materials is really to understand how these materials are going to move. So what we do is we have a bench test system. So you can see now what we're doing inside a pipe with the sugar. We're trying to then blow it along the pipe so we can see how much air we need in order to be able to move that material efficiency. And there you have something that's called erosion flow, which isn't what we call efficient movement. So now we up the airspeed. And yes, that's pretty efficient. What happens when we do something with the talc? Oh, you can see 
<laughs> again, the, the, the example, the difference between the way these two materials handle. And what we're doing with this setup is we're actually characterizing the material so that the critical parameters for making a pneumatic conveying system are then, un, are then understood by us. So the, the critical parameters would be things like um, well, the bolt densities, the basic uh, properties of the material, uh, but then also things like um, can velocity and terminal velocity of the material, um, which is what the, the pickup velocity, which is what you were looking at, which is what then um, determines how much um, air needs to go through the system. Um, all of this data is then used by us uh, to, to populate a database we have of the various materials. And then using the same system, what we can then do is input that, that criteria um, into uh, our database. And it's actually a sizing program, uh, which has some logic based on um, the material properties. So here you can see we've put down an application example at the bottom. So we're running two different materials. One's NCM and the other one I'm struggling to read, but it's PVDF, so a, a binder material. Um, and we're running both of those at various throughputs. And then our calculation program based on the material properties would then give us um, a throughput rate for um, a pump and also a line size um, for any um, piping, so for a, a pneumatic conveying system. It's also one thing I, I like to point out when I'm talking about these things is we also get a utilization figure. And I've highlighted this one in yellow uh, because this is the kind of value that I would go for if I was sizing something like this. So I don't like to, we don't like to go up into the, the, the 90 area. We like to go somewhere where we still have a little bit of security. Um, whereas if someone uh, maybe has got some bulk density slightly wrong somewhere, or we just want a little bit of extra capacity, that's the kind of thing we would build into this system. So using the package, um, using the bench tests and this bit of knowledge that we're then um, getting from your, um, from your materials, we're then able to put together a complete, not just the pneumatic conveying part, um, but also the, the handling part. So we saw just a little bit earlier, um, one of the real keys to uh, the battery business is the containment. That's certainly what I feel. I'd be interested to hear what you think as a, as a feedback. But um, with some of the materials, we really need to keep them uh, away from um, away from operators because of the danger to the operators. So this is the kind of device that we're talking about. Uh, what we can also do in um, big bag unloading as well, a lot of the, the base materials come in big bag form. Um, we can also provide those um, at OEB standards as well, um, and then integrate it into a typical system like the one that you're seeing here. So if I just then go back and let's just try and summarize what we talked about, I split it into two bits. Um, so I was talking about the, uh, the feeding system and what's the feeding system all about. And it's all about bringing the materials together into your process. Um, and it's about bringing those together um, in an accurate way so that you can be sure that um, the materials that you want, the critical materials that you want, are being fed into your process um, at the right time and in the right quantity. Um, we then have pneumatic conveying systems that are ensuring, or if you like, uh, material handling systems that are then bringing material um, safely um, in a contained fashion across to wherever in the plant um, you have your um, your process machines. So look, that was a real quick, and normally if I kind of put a perspective, it takes us um, a few hours to go through all of the uh, all of the bits and pieces we've just subjected you to in the space of around about 30 minutes. So there's a lot of information there. Uh, again, I would really stress that if there's anything further you want to know about this, and I'm sure there must be, there's a lot of detail uh, then please, we have some moments now. Um, 
to answer some questions, but also please get in touch with uh, the guys that, and the guys and girls, I beg your pardon, at Turn A. Um, ask us what it is you need. So thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Keith and Hakan, for explaining what Copier and Catron is doing in the battery market. 